Q&A time. Post your questions down below and let's begin. Hey Alex, what's your thoughts on going bear mode as a teen? I think it's perfectly fine if you're jacked enough to pull it off. Recognize that bear mode is about being extremely muscular with the fluff to enhance your already existing jack frame. So the secret to pulling off bear mode is being muscular. Now, if you're a teenager that's 14, 15, probably not going to work for you. You're just going to end up looking chubby. But maybe you're 16, 17 and you're a late novice or you're in the intermediate stage already. Now we're talking. The only con that I would see, though, for teenagers specifically, is the fact that you might not have the body hair to give you the graininess. Because bear mode is also about maximizing delusion strategies. And especially facial hair, because the thing is, you will get fatter and the chub will be very noticeable, okay? And that's why you have to grow out the beard to cover up all the fat and accentuate your jawline, your structure, all these good things. So if you're gonna do bear mode to really look the best, I believe facial hair is important. And then the body hair gives you that grainy appearance as well. And most young guys are not gonna have that down yet. But besides that, the whole concept of being in a fluffier state to get strong and just look massive in clothes and all that, it's all applicable. So I would say it's a great idea provided that you're jacked enough, but you have to figure out like, where do you stand? Are you novice, intermediate, advanced? Then there's also the fact of enjoying the bare mode lifestyle. So beyond the whole looks thing, it's just the fact that you're eating a lot of food and you're enjoying yourself and you're making all kinds of gains in the gym. You don't care about being stupid shredded and you rock the fluff with pride. My strength has never consistent. Some days I hit PRs in my program, other days I hit less reps in my last workout. What am I doing wrong? Okay, could be a few factors here, like not uh, sleeping consistently. You know, maybe some workouts you're getting five, six hours a night, then you're getting eight to nine on other days. Very possible. Or you're constantly varying the surplus or the caloric intake. So maybe three days out of the week, you're in a massive surplus and the rest you're just not eating that much, which is a problem for a lot of hard gainers actually. They complain that they can't gain muscle mass, all these things, but in reality, they're not eating enough food. So I recommend that you track your calories and even your sleep. Find out what's consistent, what are the patterns. Now beyond that, if you're still struggling, I would have to say it is a programming issue, likely not managing volume and intensity the correct way. So some days you get it, some days you don't. You're just randomly guessing. You're spinning your wheels, trying your luck. So I say you get on a more structured routine. And I recommend concurrent periodization, but keeping the sets and reps rather similar. Or maybe just doing uh, waves and stuff like that. You know, I've talked about this before, like the 6x6, 8x10x10, or dynamic effort, you know, 65, 70, 75% with a straight weight. So you can do three-week waves, or you could rotate the variations, but you keep the sets and reps rather similar. So you're constantly doing a 3x10 on your bench press, for example, but you change it up. So maybe it's a flat bubble bench, one workout, the next it's a close grip, the one after that's an incline, but you're keeping the volume intensity similar, okay? If you do it that way, if workload is always rather consistent and you're sleeping and eating enough food, you shouldn't have any difficulties um, making strength gains and plateaus should be minimized, okay? So I hope that helps you out. You think doing power shrugs on volume day and rack pulls on intensity day is enough to build traps? Absolutely, and I would say the other way around works as well. If you want a good program, which I'll lay out since you mentioned this, I would do rack pulls above the knee, five sets of five on your intensity day with the five second holds or even longer. Okay, this way you can get a lot of overload in. Remember that method is still valid, okay? And then for your volume days, just emphasize the squats instead. And then immediately after, you would do your power shrugs. So try five by 20. And if you could work up to some big numbers, let's say between 500 and 700 pounds, that's really gonna help in building up those traps. So the way that I see it, if you can do your rack pulls, just do your five by fives and all that, it's still moderate, right? But you're going heavy enough. And it doesn't have to be above the knee either, by the way. It can be at the knee or slightly below the knee. So you're still going to be covered in that regard. Even trap bar deadlifts, high handles. Then volume workouts, power shrugs, high volume. You're freaking good, my man. So that's what I recommend. Or the other way around. You do 5x5 five five power shrugs for intensity days. And then volume, you do rack pulls for a stupid high volume. Like 5 sets of 20. Or 10 by 10 Or even 1 set of 100. Or 2 sets of 50. Try those out, my man. Man, do you think there's a hybrid way to train between Hollywood and bear mode, like a state you can rock all year, which takes staples from both philosophies and is definitely optimal? Well, yeah, that can definitely be done. The, the way that I see it, it comes down to the body fat percentage and the special exercises used to emphasize strength needs, okay? So if you're trying to get that Hollywood physique, you know, chances are you don't want the biggest legs possible. So that might be modified in a different type of way. You're not trying to become the greatest power lifter. Maybe you're gonna emphasize more unilateral type lists or just doing lighter loads in general, not really taking your potential to a high amount. 
in terms of uh, strength numbers on squats and deads and all that. That could be a factor, depending what your viewpoint of Hollywood is, right? Maybe it could be minimizing your trap size. Maybe it could also be not having a big chest and instead focusing more on the shoulders, but minimizing also the forearm size. So you're emphasizing biceps instead of forearms. Then of course there's um, the emphasis on being lean, right? Maybe you rock between eight and 12% of your round as opposed to being fluffy. So there's different ways to assess it, but what I would say is if you're a natural and you train for strength, the, the main factor that's gonna decide your physique is the body fat percentage. Unless we're talking about certain areas like the neck or just a yoke in general. Actually for the yoke, I think you gotta be a bit more specific, you know, and even the legs. But just as a general base, like upper body wise, it's not a big difference. Like if I would compare my physique to Kino body, I don't think it's that significant upper body wise, you know? We look pretty similar. And it's the same with Omar Isov and a lot of other guys like that. Like the way I see it, find out what muscle groups contribute to that Hollywood uh, physique and then uh, get strong at the corresponding movements. And you're gonna end up with a great physique and then just lower the body fat percentage. I'm an athlete, squats exhaust me, make my main training worse. Can I replace them with leg press? I'll be doing RDLs as well, just need strong functional legs. Well, as an athlete, I think squats are very important, but maybe you don't have to do the free squat. Perhaps try box squats. Those tend to be a little bit more favorable on recovery. And you could also rotate the variations to prevent overuse. Look into concurrent periodization. That might be helpful for you, okay? It doesn't have to be the barbell back squat either. It could be front squats. It could be zercher squats. There's all kinds of varieties. It could be squatting with bands. Very good for explosive type training as well, which will benefit you as an athlete. So to me, the squat is a very important exercise if you're trying to excel at athletics. Maybe not the classic powerlifter style, but a variation of a squat. And there's other ways to do it as well, like belt squats. This way you could really drive the volume into the legs, but now you're minimizing the axial loading. So it's better on your recovery in that way, less exhausting, and actually attractions the hips and lower back at the same time. So it's a little bit of a restoration and strength builder. Very freaking good for athletes. So I would say you should still squat, but maybe just change up the variations a little bit. This will be more favorable to your recovery. Also feel free to incorporate other exercises like um, Bulgarian split squats and just lunges of all types. I would not replace the free weighted compound movements for a leg press if your goal is athletics. For bodybuilding, it's fantastic. It will absolutely work. And your combination that you're talking about here, leg press, RDL, you're going to get huge legs. No question about it. But it's not optimal for a sports performance. Try what I'm telling you instead. Variations and including unilateral work. I think you'll get much better results that way. Hey Alex, is rotating between three pull-up variations like pull, chin, neutral enough to in concurrent training or do I need to add more variations? Please see this. Well, I saw it, my man. It's good enough, but in the long run, you're gonna stall if you're doing concurrent. It's just, you will. Like with this approach, you're gonna have to wave your training in a sense. So doing a lot more dynamic effort, a lot, doing a lot of three-week waves, stuff like that. You're going to plateau, put it like that. If, if you max out on the regular pull-up one week, the next week, neutral. The next week, underhand. Well, now you got to go back to the regular pull-up. Like your, your gains are going to be a lot slower, my man. And, and plateaus, yes, they're going to come up 100% guaranteed. I can see this happening on a concurrent routine. So I would experiment with many more grips. That's why you see with me, with my pull-up bar, I, I'm doing it all, bro. And it's not just the grips themselves, right? It's also the way that you do the exercise. Maybe pausing at the top, maybe doing dead hang at, at the bottom. Maybe incorporating isometrics from different positions. Maybe even doing dead stop. And there's a way to do that. I'll make a video on it soon. Maybe even adding bands. Or even changing the tempo up a bit. Not my favorite strategy, but it does work. So there's different ways to program it. But with concurrent routine, where you are rotating the exercise on a frequent basis, just those three, long term, I think you're going to stall. But initially, it's going to be very effective, and you're going to be like, holy fuck, I'm making the best gains of my life, okay? Especially if you're new to weighted pull-ups. Like, I'm telling you from experience, as a guy who does 165 pounds, weighted pull-up and chin, matched it. If I just do those three, I'm going to plot to 100% guaranteed. No way around it. Unless I do these fucking percentage-based systems where I'm only doing that. But that's not how I like to train. And if you're doing concurrent, you know, it's a very different way of doing things. So, I would change it up a little bit more than that. When you're doing the, the overhand, neutral, and then chin, you can go a little bit wider or closer, okay? So you get more variations from that. Fastest way to build arm muscles, trying to fill in as much loose skin as possible from weight loss three times a week, heavy light medium. That's a great routine, but the fastest way you're gonna get uh, your muscles up is dependent upon your strength gains over time. And it's really not a fast journey for most naturals. In fact, the arms tend to be um, a rather stubborn area where you have to gain a lot of muscle over your body before you see the inches come up here. Just saying. So the way that I see it, if you're a novice lifter, yeah, the gains are gonna be rather um, quick if we quantify it over the, the long term, but it's still not gonna be like rapid. You're not gonna make steroid-like gains or anything. 
you're going to see improvements, but it's going to take some months to build up your arms. So in my opinion, you got to be a little bit more patient, but of course, focus on the journey. Don't draw your attention to the end goal so much. You just, uh, you just finished a successful cut. You got some loose skin. All right. Congratulations. Now it's time to ride out this new journey. So get stronger with your heavy light medium. That's a fantastic approach, but don't rush it. Okay. And watch over time as the months pass by, as those arms begin to swell up. But it's going to be dependent upon your strength progression as a natural. And how fast you gain that strength will be correlated with uh, your programming and how well you eat and how well you sleep. And even your genetics. People can't forget about that. A lot of factors to consider here, but there's really no shortcuts. I suppose the shortcut would be doing a nucleus overload cycle. So one week, so one month of training your arms every single day, then taking a week off and then going back into it again. That might be helpful. But still, it's something that you got to put in the work in. When you quantify it, like, bro, your arms aren't going to get massive in a short amount of time. So let's just be realistic about the situation, okay? Hi, Alex. Thoughts on the landmine squat? Well, there's two variations. Are you talking about the one where you, you're treating like a belt squat? It's all right. I find that you're limited in the range of motion, so it's better to step up on some blocks. And now you got a pretty good movement pattern. It's kind of similar to the hack squat in the way that you're going up and down with the strength curve, right? So that's very nice. It's a good alternative. Now, if you're talking about the version where you pick it up on your hands and do a landmine squat, not really a huge fan of that, especially the fact that you got to get the weight up. It's a little bit challenging. And also, I feel that front squats are far superior. So if you're going to squat, I would say just do it that way. Front squats are to squat. You'll get much better gains than a landmine squat. Easier loading potential, and it just makes more sense from a programming perspective. So I would say the uh, hip version is fantastic if you elevate yourself on blocks, but just a regular landmine squat, there's nothing magical about it. Yeah, it's another variation override the biological law of accommodation, but why don't you just do front squat or some hacks or something? You know, like there's... Other ways to train, man. Hi, Alex. Is it okay to squat after the other compound lifts and now it's programmed rather than squatting first? Thanks. Sure. I've seen some guys do that where they begin with the bench press, but understand that I set up the order in a very specific way. I want you to do it in that order because I feel that's going to work best for the majority of you guys. Okay? But if you want to start with your bench, maybe you get cramps after squatting or maybe you just find that you're too tired which again i find it to be an excuse for many right because you will adapt if you run the program long enough but if for whatever reason okay you start with the bench then you squat then you do the other stuff okay fine you're still going to reach into mid stage you're still going to get strong as fuck there's not gonna be any problems but i do feel that the original template the way i let out one exercise after the next is superior but you could do what you want ultimately if you really want to do it you'll do it and sometimes that leads us to figure out things the hard way or it ends up being a blessing. Sometimes it's okay to break the rules, quote unquote. So you know what? Give it a shot. How about that? How to warm up lower back before doing deadlifts? Well, you don't really have to. The warm up itself is building up to those heavier weights. So going from one plate, two plate, three, four, then you're at five, right? That's your warm up. But if you want to do something else, well, try out reverse hyperextensions. This will traction the lower back and um, you'll feel those glutes and hamstrings working out a lot. So by the time you get to your pose, you feel absolutely fantastic. So reverse hypers plus hanging off a pull-up bar, that's what I recommend. Or you can, use, uh, you can also do sled pulls before uh, deadlifting, but it's not really required. So try that out or just stick to the standard ramping up the weights. There's no issues with that either. Hey, Alex, how does your novice program target traps? Well, it's a system designed for first-year lifters. And ultimately, we're addressing everything from a holistic perspective. It's not a specialization system. So it's not a get-yoked novice program. It's just get strong at the fundamentals and then once you become late novice intermediate now you have real weaknesses and you can target them because right now it's not your traps that are lagging it's every single body part that's weak and small therefore we're not specializing we're not targeting traps specifically we're getting stronger at the compound movements building a nice little base and that's it your traps will hypertrophy it's the same reason why i didn't include specific work for the forms like yes Arm wrestling training is the best way of getting big forms. And the approach you're seeing in the novice program is not ideal when you get more advanced. But right now, your forms are going to grow like weeds just from doing your rows and your pull-ups and your delts. That's not going to be a problem. So it's the same thing with the traps. You get strong, you get your pulls up, you get all those numbers up, they're going to get bigger. And then when it's time to really, really focus on them, well, enjoy. So I wouldn't stress about the traps right now. But if you do want to maximize your gains, I'm going to tell you to at least train your neck because that will speed up the process given the fact that neck and traps are connected. So if you want to build an even greater base, do neck training with the novice program. If you had to choose one, heavyweight low reps or lightweight high reps for optimal chest gains, why would I only have to choose one? And why would that be the case for you? I don't understand these questions of just doing one or the other. Just do both, man. Like, what do you think concurrent periodization is all about? I have an intensity day and a volume day and that's it. 
I can skip out the volume work if I choose to, but in the long run, it's not optimal. So are we choosing something because we just prefer it? We enjoy that type of training? What's the reason behind eliminating other effective forms of training? Because we know for a fact that strength work is fantastic. And then the, the higher repetitions as well is beneficial. So why not include all? Like this is what maximized programming entails, my man. So I wouldn't just choose one. But if I could, hypothetically speaking, I would go with the volume work. I think most people benefit more from a size perspective and you're still gonna get strong in the process, okay? In truth, you don't have to do one of maxes and three by three and fives and all that. Like you can still get an excellent physique with a bodybuilding type approach. And this has been proven decade after decade. And I think a good way to do this, by the way, is with high volume pushups. That'll get you serious results. So I was only able to do one due to restrictions or maybe I'm just done with the heavy lifting. Yeah, I would definitely stick to high volume just for building general strength and size. But I wouldn't consider it optimal for reaching your potential. Certainly not. Alex, is there no way to do your program with a Smith machine? I really can't get to another gym. I have only dumbbells and a Smith machine. Well, none of my programs include a Smith machine. I don't like it. And I don't recommend you do it. I think it will increase your chance of injury. You're ingraining false movement patterns and there's many other factors in the strike development process that are being neglected. So I don't like it. Now, if you want to do it, go ahead, but it's not my program and you're doing something else. In my opinion, if you really are restricted for whatever reason, maybe it's your location, maybe all the gyms in your area do not have barbells, which is a damn shame if you ask me, but if that is the situation, well then just stick to dumbbells only and that's it. And you can do all the variations you want and you still can get very jacked and strong at the same time. So there's nothing to worry about there. It's just that you're not getting the specificity of the barbell work. So I would do dumbbells and even weighted calisthenics. Surely there's a place where you can hang off, pull a bar and do exercises like that, or even weighted dips. You know what I mean? So there's other ways to get an effective movement sit. But I will say that for the lower body, you might be a little bit limited. Although looking at it objectively, your, your gym probably has a leg press, right? Probably has a hack squat. So you can get huge legs with that. Probably has a hyperextension machine too. So you know what? You're probably okay but you won't have the biggest squat and your deadlift performance might be a little bit subpar as well, which I suppose could be fine depending on your goals, right? So I say just stick with the dumbbells, do some weighted calisthenics as well, and boom, you're good to go, but fuck this machine. Hey Alex, I've been stuck on 315 deadlift for four months because of my grip. I have the power, but I cannot hold onto the bar any more than two inches. How would you solve this? Well, man, are you using chalk or not? Because um, that might be the reason why you're failing. If you've been doing raw this entire time and all of a sudden now it's impossible to grip it, Maybe your hands are just full of freaking sweat, and that's the reason why you can't grab the bar. Or perhaps you're doing double overhand, and now it's time to switch it up. Like for most people, three plates, when you get to that point, man, switch to mixed grip, or at least hook. But I'm gonna say 275, 315, that's when guys usually switch to mix or hook. So I would definitely recommend that. If not, just use straps and that's it. Are you competitive power lifter? If not, you can do the fuck you want. There's no rules. You can wear your straps. Do your straps, then do your grip work right after. But if you tell me that your grip is constantly failing and you have these weaknesses, maybe you shouldn't do strapless right away. Maybe you should just switch to the variations I talked about and put on some damn chalk. And that'll fix you right up and you won't even have to use the straps in the first place. So try to fix the root cause first. But if you want to strap up beyond that point, be my guest. Why do you split training in general in volume and intensity days? Why are you not doing like a mix up of both in one training? Because it interferes with the adaptations. Plus with concurrent periodization, I just find that it makes more sense. Have a volume day where it's exclusively bodybuilder type training. You're not going heavy on that. It's moderate weights, right? Perfect. Then intensity day, it's all heavy. One rep maxes, three by threes, just heavy freaking loads. It makes perfect sense. It blends. And you're not interfering with any adaptations. It's just the best way to do things in my opinion. Less plateaus, easy to organize your training. You don't have to worry about overdoing certain variables. Like it just simplifies the entire freaking process. And it's the way you do it for the best results possible. So that's why I do volume and intensity days. Now, there are some strongman competitors who actually do mix it. And congratulations to them. But as I've been saying for a long time now, there's a difference between effective and optimal. So just because you can get away with it doesn't mean it's the best way to train. And I think that when you divide it, it is superior. And also I like heavy light mediums, you know? So you can either do volume intensity or heavy light medium. So different approaches. But that's how you should do it in my opinion. Except for like a few little accessories, you know, like a band face pull. I'm not going to do fucking triples. I might do a three by 20, even on intensity day, but that's just extra stuff on the side. It's not the main work. Like I'm not going to do a one rep max and then immediately after do a 10 by 10. It doesn't make sense. I'm not going to do that. 10 eggs a day. What do you think? Completely unnecessary, unethical, and not optimal for human health. You're getting a lot of cholesterol in, and there's other factors in eggs as well that I don't feel like talking about right now. But look up some plant-based resources on the internet and find out why eggs might not be the best for you. So I don't recommend this. 
You can do what you want, but to me, eggs are a no-no. So yeah, last question of the week. Which is better for back development, hypertrophy, weighted chin-ups or one-arm chin-ups? I'd say the standard weighted chin because it makes much more sense from a programming perspective. There's more variations to experiment with. Uh, anybody could do them, whereas one-arm chins, you have to be very strong to perform. And also, the progression is extremely slow. It takes forever to add a rep or two. So it's not really feasible in that regard. Uh, the strength curve is different as well, and there is a major stability component. And it's also the form that's much more difficult to do. So I would say that weighted chin-ups in general are superior. It's also bilateral movement. It's easy to load. Do more techniques like your back offsets, your drop sets, all that. It's not always going to be heavy compared to one-arm chin unless you're doing bands and stuff like that, but that's not a topic altogether. Um, in general, I would just say weighted uh, calisthenics are king for getting uh, mass gains and even general strength. Like, don't get me wrong. I love body weight training exclusively, but I feel that when you pair it with the weights, that's when you really maximize the results. And that's why I will be making a lot more content on topics like this. So stay tuned, but I would definitely say if you can only do one, weighted chin-ups, for sure. And I think in general, they build it back a little bit better. So that's my opinion. Hope helps you out. And that's it, guys. We're done this Q&A video. Post more questions down below, and I'll talk to you all next week.